Hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mitch Taco Bell. I'm your host for Tall Tales with Taco. Guys, tonight is a very special episode. This whole month is sort of a Marine Corps history month leading up into November, of course, the Marine Corps birthday, November 10th. But tonight, October 12th, as I was going through the show, uh, show schedule and talking to Scott Gibson and Steve Moore, I'm going, you know, what can we do to talk about Captain Haldane, Ack Ack Andy Haldane? And what you guys uh, may not know is that Andy died this day on Peleliu, October 12th. And this book was given to me by James A. Mishner back uh, when I was a young lieutenant in 1988. And you could tell the absolute love that E.B. Sledge had for his commanding officer of K-3-5. And I just wanted to read this real quick before I bring everybody on, because this will give you just a little hint about the man. Acclaimed by superiors and subordinates alike for his leadership abilities, Captain Haldane was the finest and most popular officer I knew. All of the Marines in Company K shared my feelings, called the skipper, he had a strong, full face of character, a large, prominent jaw, and the kindest eyes I had ever saw. No matter how often he shaved or how hard he tried, he always had a five o'clock shadow. He was so large that the combat pack on his back reminded me of the bulge of a wallet, while mine covered me from the neck to the waist. Although he insisted on strict discipline, the captain was a quiet man who gave orders without shouting. He was a rare combination of intelligence, courage, self-confidence, and compassion that commanded our respect and admiration. We were thankful that ACAC -Ac was our skipper, felt more secure in it, and felt sorry for the other companies not so fortunate. While some officers thought it was necessary to strut or order us around to impress us with their status, Haldane quietly told us what to do. We loved him for it and did the best job we knew how. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to bring on Steve Moore. This is Andy's nephew. He is a retired Marine captain of 20 plus years. Also going to bring on another active duty Marine. We've got Garrett uh, Shatrosky, second yeah. Lieutenant Shatrosky. I got that right. Absolutely. So Lieutenant Ski is our resident expert on Captain Haldane. And without further ado, my good friend, Scott Gibson, who actually played the skipper in the hit HBO series, The Pacific, which, by the way, I got to get you to sign that, boss. And um, it'll cost you. Hey, it'll cost you a beer or a ferret ride or a fox ride. How about that? A beer in the ferret. All right, I'll do that. You just got to get down here to uh, Dallas and we can arrange that, I'm sure, after COVID's kind of fixed. Uh, nice. But without... Without skipping over stuff, uh, I hope my introduction was good enough because we are here to discuss this officer, the genesis of the officer, as I put in the title of this program, and what made him so special. Um, when James Mishner gave me this book, he said, there are many officers I served for that I looked up to when I was a Marine. He goes, but this one depicted in this book is the Marine that you need to try to strive to be. And that was back in 88. And so then all these years later, then I become friends with RV Bergen and I read this book and now, you know, it's, it's just incredible. So Steve, could you do us a favor and kind of go through uh, a little bit of the family history on Andy? Sure. My grandparents uh, came over from Scotland. My uh, grandfather was uh a supervisor in a uh, textile mill in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And Andy was the star of the family. He was the youngest of three. And uh, he excelled in everything. He was a, a pretty good student. He wasn't the greatest, but he really uh, showed leadership from uh, a very, very early age. Uh, he, uh, he excelled in sports, of course. But he also really showed leadership from an early age. And I, I would have to say 
that one of the things that I think was probably the most important things that made him so uh, likable was that he didn't say anything bad about anybody else. He kept it pure. He, uh, he was sought after to be friends. He was definitely sought after by girls and he kept that pretty light. He uh, never really got into anything serious in uh, high school or college. Uh, he did, uh, and Garrett knows this and Scott knows this, that they, uh, he received a lot of letters from a, a woman uh, while he was on uh, Peleliu. Uh, I really think a lot of that came from just being alone and he had somebody to talk to. But I don't know what could have happened after that. They could have had a relationship. I don't know. We'll never know. And it's just uh, one of these things that it's a sad day. But any day that we uh, have that can uh, celebrate my uncle is a good day. Well, when you first started, uh, actually, Scott, when you studied for the role, how does an actor go about researching a guy that passed during the battle. I mean, it's not like you can go hang out with, you know, uh, Uncle Andy in, in uh, New Hampshire or something. So how did you, did you get up with Steve and talk to the family or, I know you had letters, right? It, letters, yeah, a big package from HBO with research and, um, geez, I don't, you know, 15, 20 letters or so that he wrote to the, the Dean of Bowden and as well as football coach um adam adam walsh walsh uh yeah but i mean just overwhelmingly daunting kind of how do i tackle this kind of thing so i got all that and they gave me steve's number and um uh, we had a wonderful chat and um i said by the end of it you know i said you know these are uh, <laughs> these are some big boots to fill <laughs> and uh he just very calmly said you know well andy wouldn't say that and um, through reading his letters and finding out what it, what type of person uh, he was, it, it just shone through in his letters how much he cared about the college, his his teammates, the coaches, and this bled into when he was writing from you know starting from Guadalcanal, talking about uh, the men that he was with. Um, and I thought it was important maybe to just start off by reading just a few of his words from Guadalcanal. It's the hey, first before, letter. Before you do that, does somebody have a television going by chance? I hear music or something in the background. Alexa, turn off the music. <laughs> it was Alexa. Perfect. It was Alexa. I've got good hairs, hairs still. Yeah, please read the letters. Yeah, so uh, this is October 12, 42. Um, and uh, starts, starts off, it's two Adam he's talking about having a helmet bath and how he's gone down to 155 pounds uh, from 185. And um, he says, you know, if a fellow wanted to, he could complain all day, but it's of no use for war is hell. And if a man can't take it, he soon learns. One thing I can say about war is that it separates the men from the boys. And I've got examples of it in my platoon. Take care of yourself, Adam, and keep on setting an example for young men going through college. I can sincerely say that your instruction and guiding ways have helped me greatly in this task I have of leading men. Whenever I'm in doubt as to what I have to do, I try to think back and imagine what you would do. And somehow I find myself solving a problem which at the outset seemed to leave me bewildered. Again, I say, Adam, that you have given me a pattern of living which will remain with me forever. And all I can do is thank God that I was fortunate enough to have you as a coach and a friend. Give him hell on that football field. Mm -hmm. wow. So this is where he's coming from. Um, you know, it, 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 so many of their, their letters, I mean, I think here's another one to his dean, just talking about, you know, our work is never done and we're on call 24 hours a day. It's another one from uh, Guadalcanal. My men are excellent workers. And as yet, I haven't heard a complaint. I think the steady nervous strain we are under dissipates fatigue. For I'm sure it isn't the rice we get three meals a day that gives them that extra essential energy to carry on. So there, you know, you see a sense of humor about it. Um, so just in reading this, you know, I found the, the, 
the humanity in the man, this kind of mythic legend that, you know, how do I, how do I tackle this? How do I, how do I get inside, um, you know, this person and represent them? There's only so much you can do in terms of the physical part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, which there's a lot to take on in terms of, you just see him in five, six, seven, you just see him at Peleliu, the end of the war. Um, you know, so, okay, you got to carry on all that physically, but how was he inside? And so much of it, what I felt about how to represent him as a leader was how he looked at his men and how he led his men, how he listened to his men, you know, listened to his NCOs, the corporals, the privates. He wasn't someone that yelled if he had to discipline anyone he would but you know if you ever wanted to know where Andy was he was you just had to look to the front mm -hmm. and I think in that time that he was in Peleliu he joked in one letter about the next battle and uh, I think Ev Pope another uh, Bowden alum became a company commander at the same time and so he's writing back to Adam saying uh, you know Ev has his own company now and he says geez by the end of it we're both going to come home with gray hair <laughs> and, and Andy went completely gray just the time he was on Peleliu. Really? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, he, so the stress of everything that was going on, but more so, I think, for him, sending men into battle that are going to be wounded, that are going to die, right. and how that weighed on him. And so every, every step of the way, I think he did everything he possibly could to save those men because it, it just, to me, when I was filming it and looking at all these younger guys, I'm 37 years old. So the vast majority of actors that were there were 10 years plus younger than me. Mm -hmm. And that helped in this, I mean, Andy was 27 and I was 37, but it helped me in terms of looking at these kids with, you know, Joe, Joe Mazzello, the helmet just swallows his head kind of thing, you know, and completely clean shaven. And he looks like he's 16 or something like that. And, and I, I could just, you know, picture Andy looking at these other kids and, and how that must have affected them and how it affected his his uh, his leadership. Well, I know I told you this when we met at RV Bergen's funeral, but uh, your depiction of Andy was what I envisioned from the book. You know, this is your depiction was what I envisioned him to be from the book. And Growing up uh, in 86, there were two movies that came out that we all went to go see as as young Marines. It was uh, Aliens and Heartbreak Ridge. And of course, <laughs> in Aliens, the second lieutenant is a complete boob. And in Heartbreak Ridge, <laughs> the lieutenant's a boob. So to see a captain, um, company commander depicted in, in such a honorable fashion and so well done by you. That's why I, I just love you, man. You did a oh. great job making us look good. Uh, I appreciate that. You know, you, you're talking about those other officers mm -hmm. and the boobs. He's, here's one. I think it's just that uh, Kate Gloucester, he says, the new battalion commander just came in from the States and boy, in quotes, is he GI, regulation. Mm -hmm. Little Andy has got to be on his toes now. <laughs> I told him I was from Massachusetts and all he did was grunt. Aren't mm -hmm. we off to a good start? <laughs> right? Like this is the... And, and there was another colonel there, I think, that came in, um, you know, that had them had them snapping too, kind of thing. So, he, I don't think he'd ever be the guy that would roll his eyes or or give any flack back to his his company commanders, but he certainly had his thoughts about it, and he he, you know, he took that in and he just relayed that into into humor. And I don't, I, I couldn't imagine him ever sort of dumping that on his men, you know taking that and I'm going to, I'm going to pass that down because I don't think that's the type of guy that he was. He just, he just ate everything that, that, that came at him. And when they hit Gloucester, I think he was on, he hadn't been in the fight yet. So he recovered in Australia, malaria, mm -hmm. um, which he, he got back at the, so he, he gained all the 30 pounds back in Australia. And then by the end, he started to have some more symptoms of malaria, but then he writes when he was on, uh, Gloucester that that he's not in the fight yet and he said I'm not the kind of guy you keep on the bench mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. those were his words I mean he he wanted to be in it and he, you know he he just he, I mean what what I don't know what more you, you need in terms of finding out you know the type of person he is I never thought he was 
gung-ho military or anything like that. He, he, he's a beautiful writer. Um, but I, I don't know how Steve could probably stop, you know, speak to how, what his grades were in school or anything like that. But <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that they were great, but he was certainly a, a, a great, uh, you know, he might have studied the humanities, I think. But Yeah, um, government major. It, because of those, because of those letters, because of the background stuff I did, things that uh, you know, my family, my my, both my grandfather served in uh, World War II. One was in the Air Force. He was stationed in England. My my mother's uh, father, he was in the uh, Canadian Navy. He captained uh, nine different ships during the Second World War. He sunk two subs. But the first sub he got, he was on a convoy and following radar, picks up something. His guy tells him it's porpoise, radios ahead. I think we found something. Lead ship lets him go off. He does a circle, sets off depth charges. Nothing comes up. Convoy's going ahead. He asks for another pass. Same thing. Nothing comes up. Third time around, I, I you know, I swear this is a sub. Lead ship, British ship says, experts say porpoise, return to convoy. And my grandfather said, just give me one more shot. You know, because he trusted his gut. Third pass, depth charges, up came the sub, blew it apart. <laughs> but so I took that as, you know, someone with that sort of gut instinct. Similarly, all the men talked about my grandfather, about being one of the best captains they'd ever had. And he wasn't a guy that, you know, yelled or screamed or anything like that. He just, you know, he trusts his gut, lead from the front, trust your men, you know, and, and treat them like you would treat anybody else, an officer or anything like that. So we, uh, that is the, the basis of, of everything that I put into, uh, put into it. Like Andy. Garrett, I wanted to bring you on because as a young lieutenant, tell everybody how you got involved with uh, Andy. Yeah, absolutely, Mitchell. First, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, the reading with the old breed, uh, it was in high school, history teacher gave it to me and being a kid from Massachusetts who played football, it's pretty easy to resonate with a, with a guy like Haldane. And I just remember reading uh, in the bottom of that book, there's a, a little cliff note that says that there's an award given about Captain Haldane every single year about him. And that sort of resonated with me like, man, 70 years later, they're, they're still talking about this guy. Uh, and a, a few years went by, I went to college and uh, had a chance to rewatch the Pacific again. And I was like, you know, I, I have to pull a book uh, about Captain Haldane. It has to be something written specifically about him. He's such an integral part of the show. And uh, you know, the, the most famous book in World War II, in my opinion, is dedicated to him. And I, I found nothing. Uh, and, and with that, I was one shocked to almost sad in that, you know, we're cutting to a point with World War II veterans dying out that the stories are going to gonna go away. Mm, uh, and sure. it's up to us to, to keep that alive. And someone like Captain Haldane, even though he did not survive the war, uh, it's his story is still shared by many men from, from 3-5 and even the 1st Marine Division. So I, I set out on a, on a journey to do that and, and found Steve. Uh, and he was a phenomenal resource uh, with all the things that Andy's mother had saved. It was almost like she thought someone would write something about Andy with, with how meticulous she was with saving high school printouts and uh, sports articles from Bowdoin, all the letters he had written home, every medal, uh, things from school and high school and grade school. Uh, it made my job that much easier and made me realize that you know this is a project that is, is worth undertaking and something that needs to be done. How many, uh, you said uh, when we were talking, speaking earlier, about 60 different articles were written about him in different World War II uh, books or, or magazines or different things, but nothing specifically about the whole guy, right? Absolutely. He's been in over 60 World War II books. You know, I read close to 100 uh, for the book just as resources on the three battles. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to get too in-depth and retell the story of Guadalcanal. We, we know that trying to see it from Andy's point of view, but also having the, the historical references to tie that all mm -hmm. together. Uh, and he is, he's mentioned in, in so many books fondly. Uh, and it's just one of those things. It's almost like, how, how could he be such a key piece in so many different books, but not his own. And yeah. I, you know, I, I think uh, it will be good once it's done to have his own, have his own story. Put it all together. Well, were, you, were you able to interview any of the members of K three five? Uh, yeah. Sterling Mace down in Florida uh, was one of the, was one of the few ones left. Uh, he's a BAR man. He's got his own book out too uh, that he had written, you know, and he just said the, the skipper was a guy that you really couldn't put into words as, as an, you know, Scott kind of elaborated on earlier being 27 years old, you feel like an old man. I'm 27 and I feel like an old man around some of my Marines uh, <laughs> and him, you know, Sterling Mason, 17 years old from Brooklyn. Andy was, was God. 
yeah he came in the room and and he truly was he goes i couldn't have been lucky enough that I, that was my skipper in my first battle well i wish i wish i'd known you back a year ago well a couple of years ago um could have gotten you down here to uh, hook up with rv bergen yeah it would have been amazing you know rv's mm -hmm. book speaks so highly of andy as well so you know fortunate yeah. enough that they put it in words at least yeah because i was never you know of course not able to uh meet sledgehammer but rv i heard lots of stories That's i've got some old photographs i wanted to run up here look at that guy look at andy god oh. he's so young <laughs> <laughs> hey everybody stand up for a second show you got the uniform on there that's the blouse, uniform. yeah yeah that's the uniform you got the dog tags that's awesome that stole is awesome it. stole the tags <laughs> nice there's watch. the watch with the eagle globe and anchor on it very nice that's super cool oh, oh yeah it. but here's I had, to, I had to have those here's the real andy you know i mentioned this earlier what Steve, do you know what all the little bars are on his shooting badges? Did they have breakouts or something? The hand right. They had, you know, much like the Army has today, they had a breakout for just about everything you do, I think, to include throwing a hand grenade. So uh, those are what all those bars are for, plus his uh, shooting badge. Gotcha. It was uh, it was quite a bit different than what we wear today. But uh, if you look at that picture, though, these are uh, newly minted second lieutenant and you just see three years from there, or not even about two years later, the picture of him. He looks probably eight or nine, ten years older than he does in that picture. And it was only three years. And it was a lot to do with the stress that uh, he had on Guadalcanal and Cape Gloucester. You mean like right here? Yeah, that was uh, that was at the Cape Gloucester um that was, uh, I believe, Walt Ridge. Uh, he uh, he repulsed five bayonet uh, charges with his men. And uh, to tell you the truth, I think he should have uh, received the Navy Cross for that. Uh, RV told me that after that uh, conflict, he had bullet holes in his uniform. So the uniform just passed, the uh, bullets just passed through the slack parts of his uniform and didn't touch him. So they really did start believing that he was uh, indestructible. Jeez. And how about this? This about is Guadalcanal. You can see him. He's uh, standing uh, second from the uh, left. Uh, the you know, in Guadalcanal, you can see that he has a mustache. And he was in a mustache growing contest, I think, within the battalion as part of a way of raising up the morale. And uh, the funny thing is, is after the contact contest was over, nobody told him to shave it off. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, like that just uncle. gives you uh, an idea. And on, on Guadalcanal, he was a machine gun platoon commander. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that could have contributed to his death. Uh, when he was coming down 140 that day that he was killed, he was partially way down the hill, and uh, from what I was told by uh, survivors, that he went back up the hill because a gun had not been placed the way he really thought it should be. So we went back up and, uh, you know, was in the area talking to him. People were telling him to keep his head down because there was a sniper in the area. Mm -hmm. He just popped his head over, and they shot him you know, instantly and uh, was killed. So, you know, that that experience he had in Guadalcanal as a uh, machine gun platoon commander could very well have been why he went back up that hill that day. Yeah, it could have been the death of him. Hey, Mayo? Yeah. Uh, you know, back to Walt Ridge, uh, I don't know if you're going to touch on it later in the show, but there's a phenomenal quote of a Marine that was standing next to Andy that I, I unearthed that I think just symbolizes oh. what he was that night yeah and uh this is from jim McEnry. it was captain haldane our new platoon commander became a legend that night among the marines who served under him one marine who was there said akak was right there on the line with us every time the jabs came at us he had his 45 in one hand and his k bar in the other and he knew exactly what to do with both of them once when we were almost out of ammo i saw him run that k bar into the, into the japanese soldier and pick up the basket and throw him right off the ridge the way he used to throw football he rallied us and he inspired us to fight harder than we ever thought we could his platoon sergeant said his men were taking their cue from Captain Haldane. 
He was their captain, but he was one of them. Nice. Uh -huh. Up there, up front, we up front. Yeah. I'm not telling you to do something. He's up front. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah there's a better shot of that. I agree with you, uh, Steve. I, I think that that award merited a little bit more. You know, Silver Star is an unbelievable award. But uh, those actions that night, especially the last bonds I had charged was of actually Japanese Imperial Marines, uh, mm -hmm. all over six feet tall. They're best and best. And uh, they came hard. And Andy, mm -hmm. you know, held the ground and something to be said for that. And that was in, where was that? In Guadalcanal? Cape Gloucester. Oh, Cape Gloucester. Yeah. At Waltz Ridge. Uh, you know, they had already been battered for two straight weeks going through Suicide Creek. And they came across this ridge and slowly started going up on it. And nightfall hit and realized, well, <laughs> we can't go backwards. So we're digging in. Uh, and with that. Yeah, Walt, uh, Walt's Ridge was uh, named after Lou Walt, who went on to become the assistant commandant of the Marine Corps. Uh, so he uh, he done well, too. He did. Uh, he did well uh, after after uh, World War Two. Absolutely. How about this? How about this shot right here? This shot is great. Uh, the um, the guy in the middle was the uh, temporary battalion commander when they were on Pavuvo, and he, uh, uh, it, no, I think it was the guy on the left. He was uh, called uh, Tabasco Mac. He's the heir to the uh, McElhenry uh, Tabasco sauce uh, family, no. and he was uh, he was the guy on. Pavuvu that uh, kept them together. My uncle's uh, on the far right, or not on the far right, but uh, the second from the right. There's a guy sticking his head out. I don't know who he is, but the uh, the picture on the uh, right is uh, Andy. And Steve, he, he was uh, very fond of him. I, Andy's war record, uh, his fit reps, as we call mm -hmm. them now, uh, mm -hmm. were written by him, and you know he pretty much said he was the finest officer in the battalion by far. Yeah. And um, you know, very much appreciated what he did on Cape Gloucester. Right. Yeah. Could you imagine had he not been killed that day? I mean, what he would have achieved later on in his career in the Marine Corps. <laughs> Just amazing. I, I do have to say you, I see a resemblance between Steve. You're just an older version of him right there. <laughs> Much yeah. older, especially especially <laughs> with that mustache. Look at that flash! It on, 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 up, man. That's you right there, Steve. Yeah, like he that. was about twenty five in that picture. I'll be seventy next week. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking good, Marine. I hope I look Thanks. good. It's not from clean living, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, um, what? What other stuff did you uncover during your research? Did you go to his college and were you able to speak to any anyone that was a, a classmate back in the day? Anyone survive? I actually found a guy, Albert Topsfield, who played for Bates, class of 41 as Andy. He was 97 years old two years ago, lived in Texas. Uh, and Bates had spoiled a really good season by Bowden in 1940. And he goes, I'll never, I'll remember that game for the rest of my life. It's the first thing he said. Uh, but he had a chance to do a radio broadcast with Andy after the year as both All-Americans. And he said that Hal Dane was one of the finest gentlemen he ever met. I uh, ended up both going in the Marine Corps. And uh, Albert fought at Tarawa and uh, Saipan. And he goes, when I heard Hal Dane was killed, you know, we competed not only on the gridiron, but became friends and then were brothers in arms. And, you know, something that I, I thought about for the rest of my life and just was fortunate enough to know him. And it was, you know, interesting that, that – that he was still talked about him at 97 years old. And then Andy's corpsman, Herman Belnitzer, is still alive in Texas as well uh, at Cape Gloucester. Uh, mm -hmm. And he gave a phenomenal interview just talking about how uh, the captain was easily the finest officer he ever met and talked about in a story that there was a Marine who went on a boat ride with a Navy PT boat up at Cape Gloucester without telling the, telling the captain. And mm -hmm. uh, he came back, and Andy one was obviously not happy. He goes, if you're going to get killed, you're going to get killed when I tell you to get killed, pretty much. <laughs> doing, doing, yeah. doing what we're going to do, not, not with the Navy. Uh, and he goes, also, Marine, when was the last time you wrote your mother? He goes, it's, uh, it's been a couple of weeks, sir. He goes, well, I want you to write, your le uh, write a letter to your mother every single week. Uh, and, and that Marine did that. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure the mother appreciated that. But that was sort of just like Andy said, Scott touched on it earlier, the type father figure that I'm not going to scold you, but I, I will discipline you if needed. Yeah. 
Well, the TV show actually, I mean, you did a great job and oh, there was a there was the Marine that was counting. He was counting dead Japs or he was he was counting something, counting ammunition. And they're like, hey, you need to go on guard duty. And uh, you came up and you're like, you know what? He's going to be with me tonight. <laughs> you know, he's working for me. He, he recognized right away that this guy was starting to get uh, some shell shock PTSD stuff going on and uh, and took the pressure off of him. That kind was, of stuff demonstrated. Yeah, there, I, there, I read somewhere, uh, first-hand account, where someone, uh, maybe they took that scene from there, but um, this guy that was just freaking out in the back and he couldn't be controlled, and so the skipper came over to talk to him, and I, I guess two other Marines were on, you know, one on either side kind of holding this guy up, and, and the guy just leans back and he hoofs Andy right in the nuts. <laughs> yep. And he went down, and then, of course, the guy's holding him and thinking, oh, man, he's fucked. <laughs> and Andy just gets back up and says, you know, take him away, take him to the back. And someone said that, uh, you know, the skipper, uh, why, you know, you didn't rep, you didn't do anything. We're like, why? And he, he just said, that could be any one of us. And he walked away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, seriously. I mean, that's the same. You know, they tried the, initially, there was some, some, direction you know some advice to kind of you know in certain scenes it's like you know he's yelling at sledge like come on or you know um swearing at guys or just being really loud or and that just went against everything that i felt i just couldn't uh, you know i couldn't do it i couldn't do it so i just held to that all the way through and to the point where it got to, we filmed f7 uh second f one five seven and then six and i was late getting to set because they, they would put gray in, in my hair in the makeup chair. So I'd always be the last one there and, uh, you know, make, you know, everyone else is gone and thinking, oh, I'm going to get shit. I'm late and everything. And she's, you know, talking to me about her weekend and I'm trying to be nice and everything. I'm like, just fucking hurry up and get it in my hair. <laughs> <laughs> so I got this, I got to set and I see this, you know, Dale and he's, and I, you know, oh, I was in the in makeup chair and it took a while, everything like that. And he goes, oh, no problem. Skipper, listen, I, I, I played you in this. So here's, here's what you're going to do. You're going to march the company up the hill here. You're going to, you're going to bust their weapons over, bust their weapons here. You know, he did the full Dale die, right? <laughs> And I just thought, man, I can't do that. Like, I'm not, I just know. Okay, and yet, yes, Skipper, yes, sir, yes, sir. And I uh, went to the rear, it was at the very back, and was with my first sergeant, who happened to be a real Marine, re retired Sergeant Bunch, um, served in Iraq, I think. Anyway, I, he didn't have any lines or anything. And I said, hey, Bunch, when they say action, I'm going to tell you to move the company. I'm going to ask you if the company's ready. You say, yes, sir. And then I'm going to say, move them out. And he goes, roger that. <laughs> <laughs> Got a little screen time. That's cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know if he even picked them up or not, but it was action and, and company ready. Yeah. Move them out. I think it, the camera was on sledge. So you just see me walking up and I was, I was looking at my map or something like that. So we just shot it that way a few times and then finished up and, you know, Dale starts walking over towards me and I thought, oh, he's, He's going to give me an ear feel. And he walks up to me and he says, uh, Skipper, every officer has his own way of leading. Mm -hmm. And I respect that. Shook my hand and walked away. For, for you guys don't, don't know if you're listening, Dale Dye, who was uh, Dale and his company, they would go up there and they would, uh, Fruity Joe and all the Marines, would help teach the actors how to be Marines in the show. And... Uh, oh. <laughs> Oh wait a minute! I just I just said something, and look what I've got right here. Just get back in your. <laughs> I, knew it. I, could, I could feel that he was on here. His presence was lurking. <laughs> Should I tell that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so boot camp, right? You get on the bus, get taken into the bush in Australia. God knows where I was, and. Um, I was doing, there are two, two different boot camps because of the shooting schedule. So there was one that was like nine days and ours was four. Some people say three. And of course, all the other guys, you know, shit on us. But, oh, you only got three or four days. And, I, and I'd always say, well, that's all I needed. <laughs> I'm the cap. And, uh, but anyways, I got off the bus and I was the only officer. And I thought, oh, man, don't separate me. Don't separate. I just wanted to kind of blend in and learn with the rest of the guys. And of course, Lieutenant Stokey talks to us, you know, gives a little speech about what's going on. 
And then he says, uh, Haldane, like, sir, you're with me. Everyone else over there. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I walk over. He's telling me, I'm going to, you're staying with us in the CP and this is what's going to happen and the day unfolds, et cetera, and so forth. And as he's sort of talking, it, it, I could see these, you know, two two sergeants walking toward me with their, towards me, and, you know, the Stetsons, like right here on the brow, looking like cool as shit mm -hmm. and everything. And they were just looking right through me. And Stokey's talking, and I, to this day, I have no idea what he said because I'm like, <laughs> These guys are gonna fuck me up, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I was, I was, you know, like, oh, I, I, I just stayed by Stokey the whole time. So they would, and then they get just about four feet away. Freddie Joe go, looks at me, and the first words he said to me, he goes, "Going back to your bitch tent, bitch." <laughs> and then he spat tobacco right at my feet. Just missed it like that, and I'm, and there I'm just sitting, I like. I, I started to shit myself a bit. I'm not going to lie. It was like, oh. But thankfully, in terms of the time, I, I mean, he rode me, you know, hard whenever he could or whenever he was bored. Um, but I, I only had so, you know, little time that Stokey kind of backed them off a bit. It's like, hey, this guy's got, you know, a lot to learn in a short period of time. And 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 uh, Gunny Whitfield and uh, Freddie Joe, were they were not happy with that, but. No. Oh man, you know those officers always slacking, getting away with <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. God, man. Hard to the when, uh, when the uh, Pacific was being filmed, uh, Bruce uh, McKenna called me up and was asking about my grandfather. So I told him that he worked in the, as a supervisor in a textile mill. And Bruce said, is there any way that uh, the greens and blues that uh, the Marines War were made in that uh, mill. And I said, well, do you want it to be? And he said, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, of course. But I did know that they, uh, the wood mill had the contract for all the uh, military blankets. So the scene that um, uh, Scott did with Sledge where he laid down and uh, they talked about their fathers and the blankets that kept them warm, that scene came from that um, conversation. Of course, Bruce never acknowledged that, but uh, that's uh, that's where it came from. And uh, I did have a chance to talk to Bruce a, a few times, Scott and uh, the late Hugh Ambrose, uh, Stephen Ambrose's son who wrote The Pacific. And uh, Hugh actually gave me a credit in a book, in his book, uh, for the information that I gave. So I was very pleased. Then Scott, my family and I are just so uh, grateful, for lack of a better term, uh, for your portrayal. It was uh, so touching. It hit us just like we expected him to be. Uh, I couldn't have thought, uh, think of a, a better actor. And I've, I've thought of it over the years of who could have uh, portrayed him. And Really, what you did was phenomenal, uh, and I really do appreciate it, and my family does also. Well, thank you so much, Steve. I mean that 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 means the world, and um, it, you know it's just it's just the greatest honor of my career um, forever. You know, no matter what whatever else happens, it's just it's so many things, great things in my life um, have have come from that. But meeting you, being on this. Mm -hmm podcast um garrett your book taco the friendship i have with you going to rv bergen's funeral the uh the camaraderie i have with the other actors um freddie joe popping in on here to tell me to go back to my bitch tent that, you know <laughs> that that will never get old but um it, it's just it, it's so humbling um and and fills you with pride and uh I, that, that just means the world you're saying that thank you so much sir it's true See, you know, okay. go back to that, Steve. Did uh, having having him as an uncle, did that have any bearing on you joining the Marine Corps as a young? Oh, guy? absolutely. When I was my first memory, I must have been five, and it is my first memory of my life was uh, being in the living room, and I just happened to notice a picture of my uncle for the first time, and I asked my mother who the Army man was, and she said. First off, he's a Marine, and second, uh, he's uh, your uncle, and he's dead. Uh, he was killed uh, during World War II, and she went on to tell me about him 
and the Marine Corps, and I really do believe I enlisted that day. Now, as years went on, the, the Marines kind of went out of my mind as a, a teenager. But uh, I was floundering, I was about 18 years old, and I started thinking about the Marines, and I started thinking about my uncle, and I went for it in a very big way. And all through my career, I would like to say there were periods, short as they might be, that I felt that I had uh, acted like he would have. And I'm very proud of those moments. Um, unfortunately, not, not enough of them. I, there was no way that I could even pretend to be my uncle. Number one, it wouldn't have been true to myself, but also he was one in a million. That's what people kept on telling me. There was, from the time I was a kid, uh, people would talk about, I did find out he was my uncle. They talked great admiration and a, a sincere sense of loss. It was throughout my entire life and getting away with things as a kid because I was his nephew. Um, my uh, elementary uh, principal um, on several occasions told me how much I was not like my uncle. Uh, <laughs> when I was in high school, I was not very punctual and I thumbed to school just about every day. So I had to get a chit uh, at the front desk. And one day the clerk asked me, she said, you're uh, Janet Haldane's, uh, Janet Moore's son. And I said, yes. And she said, Andy Haldane's nephew. And I go, yes. She said, you kind of look like him, which I didn't think. But that next day and every day after that, when I got to school, the chit was on the counter. I didn't even have to ask for it. So that was the type of impact he had on people. It worked out very well for me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, uh, it, it continued on. Uh, so many cases of uh, me being uh, lifted up simply because I was uh, his nephew. Well, let me ask you, when, what year did you retire from the Corps? Uh, 1991. Uh, I get back from the Gulf War and I was out about three weeks later. So in 81, when this came out, I mean, before then, the average Marine wouldn't have known of your uncle. Right, right. So so when this comes out in 81, how often would you be sitting there and all of a sudden somebody go um, talking about him and then you just casually mention, oh, well, that's my uncle. Not, you know, not as much as you would think. Um, I found out about the book uh, in the Marine Corps Gazette. Uh, Sledge was doing um, episodes or uh, segments uh, of the book. And I, I was reading it and it's, it's, it was talking about K through five. And I said, well, I know how to spell that. And uh, since I'd grown up with it and I wrote him a letter and it was like, uh, it came back the same day. It was so fast. Then he uh, gushed on. He didn't realize that uh, Andy had uh, siblings and he invited my mother to the 1st Marine Division reunion. K-3-5 had a uh, separate dinner every time. So she got to meet a lot of the survivors. And that was right around the 1980s that uh, that happened. So it was great for her because she got to hear all these stories firsthand uh, from his men. And it, it had a, a big impact on her. And I got to go to the same dinner uh, around 2007 and met RV and had the same experience. Oh, that's phenomenal. <laughs> and when did your mom pass? She uh, passed in 1985. Oh, wow. So she had a few years at least to yeah. mm -hmm. to have talked to some people about her brother's actions. And oh, that's amazing. But in, in my town, everybody knew him uh, mm -hmm. and everybody revered him uh, as a kid. You know, uh, he was a, this great athlete. My grandparents and none of the other friends of his parents wanted him to play football. So they'd get home on Sunday. They built a little fort out in the woods. They'd go there, take off their Sunday best, and put on these uh, makeshift 
football uniforms they had, go out and play football afternoon, all <laughs> afternoon, and come back, change back in, and that's they went home. Of course, they went home a little bit bruised, so it must have been one hell of a walk as far as my grandparents were concerned. <laughs> hey, hey Steve, Steve did, did it help you get any dates? No, in fact, uh, the girls were a little bit too young to know about my uncle, and I was not about to go out with women that knew him. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, little cougar action, Marie, let's go. <laughs> little cougar action. <laughs> little cougar action. What's wrong with you, man? Well, how about you, Garrett? You have any good good stories that you unearthed? Some good yeah. vignettes? Uh, you know, I thought it was a, a one as you, know, you can attest. All, everybody can attest here. You know, leading Marines is an unbelievable privilege, and I, and I think if you do right by them, they will do anything for you. Uh, you know, and stepping on brown field, you know, nervous as hell, drill instructor, sergeant instructors everywhere. Uh, I guess seated in this auditorium four days in, and. You know, your hands at parade rest and you snap and you sit down and all of a sudden a picture of Andy comes on the screen. And I, I, I don't even think I was like seeing it for real. Like, that, that can't be real. And uh, it was. And it was talking about us as candidates. If we make it through this, this is the ideal relationship we're going to have with our enlisted. And it was um, Sludge's quote about Andy that you read at the beginning of the segment. And still, you know, 76 years later. Haldane's still being taught at OCS. And then we got to the basic school and we had to write a piece of paper on leadership. And uh, Haldane was one of the options that you could have to write about. So, mm -hmm. you know, still in the fabric of the Marine Corps, which I think is phenomenal. Um, and, and two, it was, a, it was a really cool paper, uh, letter that was written by the, the father of a corporal who was killed at uh, Cape Gloucester. And he had, um, from, a, from a hotel room in Manhattan, had written to Andy's mother saying, you know, my son was killed and Andy had written me a letter uh, about how my son passed away and how great a Marine he was. And it troubled me very much to find out that your son was killed. And uh, I just wanted to write you to let you know that, you know, I think he set my son alive as long as he could. Uh, and my son was so happy that he got to serve underneath him. And just, you know, being able to do that, the testament of, of, of Andy, you know, years later, I thought was just, you know, remarkable. I just so I what? Yeah, go ahead. I just gonna say I found something he wrote um, about the Ridge, the Ridge Affair. It says I've never seen such a cool group of men before in my life. That Ridge Affair tested their metal, and gosh, what a grand job they did! I'd like to tell you about it, and tell you what I think of my men, but the censor wouldn't allow that. So you'll have to be satisfied with my condensed opinion that I wouldn't trade one of those men that spent that night on the Ridge with me for a dozen so-called fighting men. They are tops with me. Nice. I mean, that you know. Use the chills. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, a few years ago, I went to Arlington Cemetery with my son, and we were up on the uh, rise in the area that he was buried, and I looked down among the stones, and it was quite a distance away, and I noticed an object on, a, uh, on the tombstone. So I looked at it and then I told my son, I said, that's your uncle's grave. And he said, yeah, right. And we walked down there and it was uh, someone had placed the stone there. So it's a sign of respect. And if you see uh, Schindler's List, you'll see them putting stones on at the end of the movie. So that was uh, really quite moving. And it, like Scott says, it's so long since this happened 77 years 77 and years, there's yeah. still people uh that are so enamored with him it it's it's unbelievable uh and it really the pacific kicked that off sledge's book was the star but mm -hmm. the pacific the miniseries really started people's interest my son was a marine from 2005 to uh 10 and it was just starting to creep in at that time. And, uh, you know, now uh, my sister was at a funeral uh, a little while ago and there was a Lance Corporal there in blues. And my sister was talking to him and said, well, I was a Marine captain and that uh, my uncle was a Marine captain, Andy Haldane, and the kid knew everything about him. He went on and on and on and here's some Lance Corporal, you know, 
out of nowhere knows everything about my uncle. It was it was really amazing. Wow. It it's great. So if you, if you could if you could do three words, well, I'll give each one of you two words. Two words to describe Andy's leadership that you would pass on to a, a new second lieutenant. Two words. What two words, Steve, would you tell a new lieutenant, new minted lieutenant, to be like Andy? What two words would you describe? Uh, compassion and commitment to his, his people. Um, like that. That, was, that was pretty much what I think he was about. Garrett, putting you on the uh, spot. Yeah. <laughs> he, he stole one of them. Well, humbleness and, and strength. Uh, you know, Andy was like we mentioned earlier, he would never say any of these things that we're talking about him right now. I, I honestly don't think he'd be one to ever say how great he was. Um, so you know, being a humble officer, I think, is very important. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one, Scott. What would you say in your research and your portrayal? Oh man, um, say empathy. Definitely saw that that he exuded that. Yeah, in 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 so many ways, and um, you know, some Freddie Joe was talking about the other day on a, on a another podcast we did about you know being a badass, mm -hmm. and a, and you know a true bad a badass has softness in his heart, mm -hmm. and. And you know, few, few, few uh, greater badasses than he was on on the battlefield, but he had that softness in his heart. So uh, I would say that. Thanks, Freddie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Freddie's still on here, I was looking at the comments. And he got he, he got thinking, bored and went for a beer. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm thinking family because he treated his men like his sons, right? Family. And, yeah. and kind of like what Garrett said earlier, you take care, you take care of your people. They're going to take care of you. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how good I am. My, my guys could let me fall on my sword any day and twice on Sunday if I didn't take care of them. So if I'm sitting there eating steak and they're sitting back eating MREs, not going to go over well. Yeah. Um, he was family. He was a leader. He was in the front. Um, the compassion is a big one. I, I really saw that in the show, the compassion for his men. Uh, there was a scene where the track was coming by and he stopped the guy. Hey, you're going to take our wounded. That mm. that doesn't go unnoticed because I could be the next wounded guy laying there waiting for a ride and you're going to let these guys go. No. Uh -uh. You know, so take care of his men. That that is probably the biggest uh, takeaway. If I were to tell a young lieutenant, um, kind of like air crew on our C-130s. You know, you had some of the most brilliant guys sitting there reading Lee's lieutenants or writing dissertation. You're getting your master's and you're a corporal. You know, I don't have a master's. Holy crap. <laughs> and and you're 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 talking to these guys and, uh, you know, you have a good time on the road You take care of them. They take care of you. It's it's just, a, you know, there's a, something to be said about that. Even in combat, uh, all the infantry guys that you talk to, they're just like, hey, man. You take care of your guys and, and they're not going to fall asleep. They're going to remember they're going to take care of you and they're not going to let you uh, fall on your sword. Mm -hmm. uh, Freddie Joe said hard and fair. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's yeah. a good one, Freddie Joe. And he also said, Scott, you cried like a true butter bar. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to. I did. I, I did tear up when he, when he, uh, you know, at graduation when he saluted me, called me Captain Haldane instead of Lieutenant Dick Licker. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just, I started to tear up a little bit. You know, he moves on and then like, you know, months later we're friends. He's like, yeah, you teared up. Yeah, I saw that by <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Oh, good. Jacqueline, uh, now Jacqueline is related to the Bassalone family and she's also a Dallas girl. She lives about 25 miles away from me. Steve, she says, I approve of that mustache. Look at that. That is nice. That's awesome. Steve, you should thank you. you. Thank you. 
You should show uh, you should show another you should show a picture of your brother, his stash. Oh, I, yeah, I don't have that with me right now. Oh, but it's like thinking, <laughs> it, it goes right down to here. It's just outstanding. It's like a biker. Oh, uh, Michael Sheriff, he's a, a partner, a buddy of mine over in the UK that uh, we work in conjunction on different shows for Top Gun and different things. Uh, Ed Fitzmorris, he's a uh, C-130 guy, lives down in Florida now, four-way looking good. Jeff, October 12th. We got to remember that, you know, maybe we can make that a uh, another Marine Corps day thing. Parker Perkins, yeah, perfect. Parker you know, Perkins. I, I got to go to uh, Peleliu a couple years ago. And the first day I'm sitting in a restaurant with my uh, girlfriend and uh, this uh, man who was uh, the director of uh, explosive ordnance disposal on the island and they're still blowing things up. Um, he asked me why I was there, and I said, well, my uncle, uh, Andy Haldane, and they said, Ack, Ack, they knew exactly who he was, and the guy's wife says to me, oh, it's like being around royalty, and I went, come on, I'm the guy's nephew, and they, they still had such a high regard. They took me out to a ravine adjacent to Hill 140. We had a uh, little ceremony. They produced some flowers that I stuck in the, uh, the face of the hill and uh, a beer that I poured down the, the side of the hill, kind of like a communion type of thing. Right. And it was uh, very touching uh, that people there knew about them. Uh, my girlfriend and I swam... Uh, an orange beach out to the, towards the reef, but the current started taking us out. And we swam back in the last hundred feet or so, we uh, ran in as if we were, you know, landing there. Uh, the next day I talked to the EOD guy again and he said, oh really, you swam orange beach? And I said, yeah. He says, well, did you see any saltwater crocs or tiger sharks out there? And I said, <laughs> no. He says, well, that's where they hang around. So uh, another casualty averted. <laughs> God, Thank you. let me know. Yeah, yeah. Thanks in advance for the uh, the warning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Holy crap. How was it out there? I mean, what time of the year were you there? We were there uh, in the spring. It was beautiful. Uh, was it? But I can't say that you wouldn't know a battle was fought there. There was uh, artifacts everywhere. Everywhere you looked, there was ammunition. There were helmets. There were uh, field pieces. Uh, there was a cave full of Japanese equipment. All the uh, all the caves we visited uh, had uh, Japanese beer bottles in it and Coca Cola bottles because the the Philippines had a Coke uh, factory there and the Japanese continued to produce it throughout the war. So all the Japanese soldiers uh, were drinking Coca Cola. Oh, that's amazing! Did mm -hmm. you get to bring anything home or? No, no, no. They don't really want you to touch anything. Uh, yeah. But and there's 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 areas that are still blocked off because of uh, live ordnance out there. Uh, we saw we were on a uh, a tour. We we're at the the top part of the island on a platform, and we saw this smoke, and then I actually saw a shock wave coming at me, an explosion. They had blown up. 10 tons of ammunition right at that time. So we were very fortunate to be on that hilltop when that happened, because uh, we could see what the potential danger and what the potential damage all those weapons had on Peleliu. Oh, sure. I bet you there's 16 inch shells sitting out there. Oh, yeah. Buried somewhere. I just read an article the other day about, I think it was in India, uh, two brothers, they, they find old ordnance from World War II. And these guys cut them apart, not realizing there's gunpowder and stuff in there. And they're blowing up all the time. So, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the danger is real for sure. And it's rusted. I remember Okinawa going through the caves and the salt water and the and uh, the salt air and the constant water and humidity. When we went into the caves, the metal was completely gone. So the you'd see cylinders and the cylinders were the explosives on mortar rounds or different things. And uh, all the metal was rusted and gone away. Um, now at Iwo Jima, stuff was per perfectly preserved. It was mm -hmm. there for two weeks for the 50th. 
and you would go through the caves there and that was exciting because everything was there i mean there were 30 dead japanese that they discovered in a, a medical cave and they're all mummified and just laying on the cots i always thought that letters home to iwo jima or letters from iwo jima the second movie the japanese side was from that because those guys had all written letters knowing they were going to die they got trapped in this cave and they wrote letters to their to their parents before the auction ran out or they succumbed to their wounds but uh yeah two different two different types i mean you found lots of things there were little um glass things full of um morphine and they told us whatever you do don't bring any of that back to japan because you'll go to jail i mean you'll be in naha prison for importing drugs um so we just i mean they were everywhere you would just step on them and shells were everywhere pieces of airplanes there was a thing called the million dollar pit where they just bulldoze stuff right into this big pit probably go down there and find yourself pieced together a nice b-51 if you wanted <laughs> or sherman tank i mean look how much those are going for nowadays mm -hmm. but holy crap that would be an adventure i know rv got to go back to pelu with rick perry and uh governor perry at the time and um uh, oh geez um uh, you know let me tell you something uh ross pro ross oh. <laughs> you know let like me tell you it, 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 it was this time there was this time he was a guest for her marine corps birthday ball man there was this time that there was this marine sitting up in the mask of a ship and blah 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 oh and that reminds me of another story let me tell you about this time this fella he came up blah, blah. He, he, greatest guy in the world very nice big and that was I, I was I was so nervous meeting RV the first time at the premiere. He was he was there uh, with Sid Phillips, and uh, the guy who portrayed RV, Martin uh -huh. McCann. He introduced me to him. He said, you know, RV, this is Scott Gibson. He, he portrays uh, Skipper, and he just looked me up and down, and he goes, "Well, we'll have to see how you measure up." <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, straight no pressure, no pressure yeah. at all. Holy and then and then later on a few years later at Christmas I went to uh, Texas and my brother one of my brothers lives there to Dallas and um, his daughter Terry Lee Bergen um, through a mutual friend arranged a lunch at a restaurant there and was waiting for him in the lob I think it was the lobby or foyer or something like that and all of a sudden he just comes running in through the door like I mean he was you know a young man just spry and everything like that and, he, he was just so full of life and engaging and um you know i just had a few questions you know chat and then a few questions i said what was your worst day and he said uh, crossing that airfield oh yeah yeah it was just that it felt like forever you know guys were some were running some were walking someone just stopped in absolute shock and everything and he goes it just was it felt like it was never gonna end how long did it take you guys to film that scene? Speaking of Cro crossing the airfield, yeah. Whoa, you know because of the two different stories, you know, Lecky still being in there, and he he makes it up to where the fuselage of the plane is. Runners hit, so he goes back to get a medic. Shell hits, slams him against a tree, and he's he's out. Um, so the two stories combined. I mean, it took us six weeks to do each episode. So. Wow. I'd say the airfield was a good, I felt like two weeks, I felt like two years really. I mean, it was just, they shot the shit out of it, you know, a 35 millimeter camera and you had the, the initial crossing one day they had, um, I think there were f like 300 extras. I'm not kidding. It spread out way, you know, like, cause it, th that airfield they built, I think was legit what it looked like and size mm -hmm. and everything it was it was mm -hmm. insane the pyrotechnics they had and all the all the debris so i mean you didn't have you know as, as long as you were looking at that you just you actually really felt like you were you know without real real shells or anything like that obviously but well man, you got pyrotechnics so you could still get blown up or injured or hurt mm -hmm. did they have did they have little lanes for you like hey dude whatever you do scott run down this lane but don't go left or right or you may get blown up by well that's what takes longer to you know rehearse because it's they're all flagged where the where you know they blow up so you run 
just, you know, and it blew, I, I forget what was in it, you know, maybe mostly dirt and uh, I don't know what, you know, fertilizer, <laughs> what the hell, what, what was in it. But so you, you'd walk through it a few times and then you, you do, uh, you know, slower, faster walk and then a jog and then full speed and then you shoot it. They pull the flags out. Freddie Joe out there rearranging the flags for you. Get them, get them flags out of there. Get them. Uh, yeah, no, they pull all, all those out. And like the pyrotechnics, I mean, Badge, when he got hit there against that tree, and he, he was talking about this the other night, they, they rehearsed it. They put a harness on him and he was on a crane. So he comes back and I, you know, medic, medic. And he's looking around and then the shell hits. And so they rehearsed it, and he's supposed to fly back, and I think maybe hit the tree with his back or something. He has his Tommy gun in his hand, and they're telling him, you know, make sure you drop the Tommy when you hit the tree. But the explosion went off, and I mean, he goes, he looked, he goes, wow, and oh shit, and then the, the crane pulls him, and he flies back. Um, but he hit the tree wrong, so they had to redo it. But it oh. took, it was such a huge explosion. <laughs> And it took 24 hours to, to remake it. That's how much pyro they put into that. And then um, Tony Toe went to, uh, I guess they were trying to figure out, okay, what went wrong, what went wrong. And Tony's like, he, he directed it, and one of the producers. He said, you know, Badge, listen, I'm going to do it. I got to do it. I'm going to do it. And Badge said, no, 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 Tony, listen. I just, I was taken aback by the size of the explosion. And, uh, you know, I paused. And then he's like, no, 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 I'm going to figure it out. So Tony gets in the harness. And, uh, you know, they, there, there was no explosion or anything like that. But two, three, one. And they pull him back. And he's holding the Tommy. And he hits the tree, you know, face forward. He didn't let go of the Tommy. And it swung around and smashed him right in the face. It just blew up his nose. It didn't break it or anything. It was just, you know, blood pops out of there. Um, but, they, yeah, they, that, I don't know, one pyro might have cost him like a couple hundred thousand dollars. Jeez, man, can you imagine? And what was your favorite weapon that you carried in the series? 45. 45 <laughs> or that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 40, 45. Mm. I, I didn't have a K-bar. 45. <laughs> yeah, I trust that 45 more than the carbine to take him in. <laughs> yeah, this is this is uh, James Mishner's 45 from Iwo Jima. Oh, this, oh right, yeah. This is actual 1941. 45 so pretty cool what about uh woody will woody williams is he still around could, could stick around yeah yeah woody woody i think is coming down the 12th i think he's going to be here the 12th oh very cool so you know what you reminded me now i'm gonna have to I, i've got an m1 grand that i get everybody to sign when i meet him i'm gonna have to get woody to sign that as well well, guys, I've been keeping you on for an hour and eight minutes. And for the 12 folks out there in uh, Internet land watching this, what would you guys like to say to sign off, Steve? Well, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. And uh, keeping Andy's uh, legacy alive means a lot to me. Uh, it's really come on in the last few years. And I'm glad that uh, as I'm getting older, that it's being passed to some very, very young Marines uh, so that they know about them. And that like Garrett, a, a new second lieutenant, that he has been exposed to it. And I try to emulate him when I could. If uh, you do the same thing, Garrett, you'll be uh, way ahead of your peers. Uh, he was a great man and I'm really proud to be his nephew. Outstanding. Garrett, when are we going to have a book made? Hopefully uh, next year and a half. Uh, the title is The Final Whistle, The Life and Legacy of Captain Andrew Haldane. Um, you know, hopefully it'll be in that 350 to 400 pages. You know, there really is that much to write about him. Uh, wow. So. Uh, How many words are you up to now? Uh, I have about 60,000 words in an outline. It's 185 pages long. Uh, so wow. going through that, uh, very very fine tuned you know there's i was shocked at how much stuff like i said was written about him uh from a variety of different sources so compiling all that to make sure that there's no stone uh unturned because he deserves it and Whoa. it's been a hell of an honor and 
uh, Steve, you know, if, if I can act like one eighth that he does around my mm -hmm. Marines, uh, I'll be happy. And, yeah. you know, I appreciate you having me on tonight and, uh, you know, Semper Fidelis. Hoorah. Garrett, I can't thank you enough for coming out. Scott, so. how about you? Oh man. I mean, <laughs> what can I say that, you know, again, just, uh, the greatest honor as an actor, um, you know, to meet so many Marines and, you know, look at, they look at you as sort of the embodiment of someone like that is, uh, but, you know, words really can't describe it. So it, maintaining his legacy um, is such an honor to me. And, um, you know, he, he was someone that obviously had an impact on making the world a better place. Um, but, in, you know, personally, he's made it uh, a better place for me any time that I felt or feel, uh, you know, in a dark place or, or have any struggles. Um, I always think, well, what would Andy say? Yeah. And I remember those words that um, he says to Sledge, which obviously were in the script, um, where he says, you can't dwell on it. You can't dwell on any of it. And that always resonates in my head. And it's just keep going forward, you know, and don't be so hard on yourself. And any kind of stress that I have, it, it just it just pops into my head and I, and, and I think of him and it helps me tremendously. That is awesome. Garrett, what do you think about this? Get Scott to be the guest of honor for a Marine Corps birthday ball, right? Dressed as Andy in that hey. uniform to give a talk about leading his men through the battle. Because as we discussed, he, he ran through the pyrotechnics. It's just almost like being there, except <laughs> no, the wind doesn't kill you. But still, you get that sensation, that feel for it. I think that would be... Uh, if you're listening, uh, General Berger, that would be the guest of honor that you want. So, I agree. Train. As long as you can drink Jameson, you'll be all right, Scott. <laughs> Freddy, you drink Jameson, Scott? Too much. <laughs> Fre Freddy's, Freddy, if Freddie was still listening, he'd be losing his shit. He's like, what? Get that Canadian, <laughs> Get that Canadian down. You know why? He'd be yelling at me, too, stupid butter bar. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> well, let's see what uh, we got. Joe here. I have to catch oh, the one tomorrow. Taco freaking long day. Super Fidelis. Nice. Freddie says fillers earth. Oh, he's Canadian. He can't drink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, man. Um, Pamela, Pam's father is Medal of Honor recipient, Ron Rosser uh, oh. from Korea. And he just uh, passed. Um, God, Godspeed. And I tell you what, her father, her father, just an incredible uh, man in Korea, um, in the army. And he, he, uh, he got the Medal of Honor from the United States, of course, and he got the Korean, uh, South Korean Medal of Honor. He killed so many Chinese in one day. It was just a horrific battle, but uh, the, the guy you want standing next to you, for sure. But mm. that's, and then of course, Jacqueline says epic. epic. There we go. Hey, epic. Jack. <laughs> well, guys, I can't thank you enough for uh, coming out, joining Tall Tales with Taco. Steve, I got something for you. Garrett, I got something for you. Scott, you've already got your present, don't you? So I do, sir. Care. Thank you. Thanks so much, you guys. Hey, I can't thank, thank you, you so enough. Much. This is uh, one of those things that I, I plan this out in my head like, okay, October is going to be history month. And, and when you mentioned that, the twelfth was his death. I go, how perfect is that? We'll mm. keep, we'll keep uh, Andy alive. We'll talk about him. Uh, next week we're going to talk about uh, E.B. Sledge. The week after that we're going to talk about Barcelona. So October is sort of uh, World War II History Month, and I'm really excited as uh, we get family and we get people together to talk about stuff like that. It's kind of cool. Oh, it's, yeah, it's awesome. Steve, great so great work, to man. see you. Nice to see you, Scott Garrett. Nice to see you again. Absolutely. Scott, Garrett, we'll you, talk soon. Yeah. If absolutely. you guys if you guys stay on for a minute, I'll uh, close up and I'll get back with you in a second. All right. Okay. All right, gentlemen. Have a good one. Hoorah. Hoorah. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for joining Tall Tales with Taco. This has been a fantastic night. As I uh, told you, next week is going to be Henry Sledge, E.B. Sledge's son. Of course, uh, if you have not. Go, go out and buy yourself a copy of With the Old Breed. Um, try to read it before next week. If you have questions pertaining to the book or the life of 
young uh, sledgehammer, that would be the time to ask. You've got Henry, his son, on the show. Uh, Henry is actually going to show us. He's got uh, the Bible that uh, uh, Sledgehammer had written notes into the Bible and uh, different artifacts and things that he owns uh, that he got from his father. And we're going to have a great show. So um, join Scott and I and Henry next week. And then Scott uh, comes back, hopefully, uh, for Jacqueline's show for uh, Barcelona, And we will have some fun with that as well. So you guys, until next week. You all have an awesome day. Remember, it's Taco Tuesday. Tip your waiters and waitresses. Go out and get your tacos because, God, they're good, aren't they? And what should I end the show with tonight? Here we go. Guys, have a great one. Bye-bye.